some people say, particularly some economists say, when you get a new technology, it always destroys some jobs and creates new jobs. So, for example, being a ditch digger is not a good occupation anymore now that we have backhoes. They're just better at digging ditches. Big muscles aren't much value. Um, but, of course, those people can go off and do paperwork. But when you get super intelligent AI, it'll be able to do the paperwork much better. And there's not clear what job those people are going to do. So I believe that we're going to see fairly soon a massive loss of jobs, mundane intellectual labor, like the things a paralegal does at a law firm of looking for similar cases, or people in a call center who are badly paid and poorly trained and do their best to answer your questions, but aren't very good at it. And AI will do a much better job. Right. And we could keep going on and on and think of so many examples throughout our yes. labor market where there are routine, repetitive tasks that maybe a, a general purpose or even a narrow AI could do, let alone a super intelligence that is many times more powerful than us. So it seems to me fairly clear that there will be massive job loss. Now, that job loss comes because we've got increased productivity. And that should be good for people. In an ideal world, if you have increased productivity, everybody gets more goods and services. That should be great. But because of the system we live in, we know what's going to happen. That a lot of poor people will lose their jobs. And a lot of rich people will get even richer. And that's going to be very bad for society. So many economic and societal implications of replacing a lot of this work that people find meaning in today and take an income out of. And just like wealth, the distribution of jobs and good paying jobs is going to be very, very unequal. Yes. Um, so you've hit on two things there. There's the, you need a job to get an income, um, but you also, most people use their job to get self-respect. They, okay. The job they do is who they are or a large part of who they are. And universal basic income will be necessary if a lot of people lose their jobs. And it'll stop them starving. They'll be able to pay the rent. Um, but it won't deal with the loss of self-respect by being unemployed. And right. so it's, I don't think universal basic income is a simple solution to everything. I think it'll be necessary, but not sufficient. There have actually been experiments in Britain that showed that it was very effective. Um, and it was an experiment, I think it was done in Wales. I'm not sure of all the details. But what they did was they took orphans, people who grew up in orphanages, and got to the age of 18. And then they're kind of put out into the world. And a lot of them can't cope. And because it's a rather small number of people, you can afford to give them universal basic income. And people from other areas can't just move in and say, I'm an orphan, I should get it, because they're not. Um, so that apparently worked extremely well. The people who were getting a reasonable universal basic income did much better negotiating the transition to being adult than people who weren't getting that, people just getting normal social security. Right. And that was actually a very well-cited pilot around the world. Basic income advocates globally were amplifying the news from that. And these are actually findings that have been echoed across quite a few studies as well, where if you give somebody some basic economic level of security, it gives them more negotiating power in the labor market. It gives them a little bit more ability and freedom to search for better work or maybe to look for other ways to uh, build their career or get back to society. Recently, we've seen a number of notable tech and AI leaders also come forward and talk about UBI, saying they, some, they support some form of it. Would you say that your understanding of the risks of joblessness is pretty common in the industry? Yes, I think most, I mean, all the big AI companies are investing many, they're basically investing hundreds of billions of dollars in advancing AI. They wouldn't be doing that unless they thought there was a lot of money to be made. And the place there's a lot of money to be made is from increasing productivity. And what that really means is getting rid of people and having AIs replace them. Now, there's some industries 
where it's not a worry, like healthcare. If you could make doctors 10 times more efficient, we'd just get 10 times more healthcare. It's an elastic market. Old people like me can absorb any amount of healthcare. So it's not going to put doctors out of work to make them more efficient. But in other areas like call centers um, or paralegals, it's going to put people out of work and it already is. Right. It seems to be a very strong business case to be automating many types of work. Certainly yeah. not every occupation, but there is a huge segment of the labor market where the, the businesses and maybe the consultants have figured out this makes economic sense to automate. Yes. Right. And, and it's not just maybe... going to be sort of, it's not just going to be relatively poor people. If I was a big consultancy firm, that got paid lots of money for spending a month to write a report on something, I would be very worried about the fact you can now get AI to write the same report in 10 minutes. And you can scale this out across every industry where right. intelligence is becoming commodified. Maybe one of the only exceptions I've seen uh, in the tech space of a leader who has pushed back against this is your friend, Jan LeCun, chief scientist at Meta, who says yes. AI will cause major labor disruption but there won't be mass unemployment. What would you say to him? Um, I don't believe him. I mean, some economists agree with him. And it's true that there have been previous things, like automatic teller machines, didn't cause mass unemployment among bank clerks. Um, but I think this is different, because this can do all kinds of mundane intellectual labor. And I think it will cause massive unemployment. And the real problem is this, all those people who become unemployed, they used to pay taxes, they're no longer paying taxes. Um, if you can have universal basic income, where's the money going to come from? And I think the money should come from somehow taxing the AIs that do their jobs. Um, that would provide the money. But of course, the big companies are going to be very, very unhappy about taxing AIs. That's right. There's certainly a lot of interest in UBI these days and a lot of questions on how this could work. And yes. the, the design space of it is so large. One of the number one questions, of course, is how we fund this. Yeah. And to ground this in the real world and practical policy, it's often useful to think of it as two complementary models of basic income that already work today. And there are ways of funding it. There's what's called a guaranteed minimum income some call it a negative income tax or a livable income. And many benefit systems today and our EI system actually has elements of it, which is it kicks in when you need it and it keeps you out of poverty. And these could be paid in any which way. It could be paid by tax dollars or, or other means. Well, of course, people do fall through. So advocates like UBI Works are pushing for a more broad-based guaranteed income measure to maintain a basic level of standard of living for everyone. And of course, this seems to be a clear policy option to help those who are displaced. And there's a second model of basic income, which is actually quite close to what you mentioned, Jeffrey, which is to see it as a dividend from some public or natural form of wealth. So you can think of sovereign wealth funds or carbon dividends are a very good example. There's growing interest in the idea of AI dividends. And there's already very strong precedents around the world. Alaska and Norway both have sovereign wealth funds that pay their citizens directly. In Norway's case, their pensions. And there's certainly calls to adopt similar models here in Canada. But in fact, some people have actually called for sovereign wealth funds and dividends precisely as an answer to AI, including mm -hmm. people like Sam Altman. And so you can imagine a public national fund that holds shares of the biggest companies and it could collect revenue from land through something like a land value tax. And this is because that's where wealth is going to increasingly concentrate as we automate more sectors of our economy, the biggest companies and land. And this is in one way of thinking of it could be a proxy of giving everybody a economic stake in the upside of AI without handpicking and taxing a certain sector or a certain company. And uh, this is just a short primer on how to think of it that could be 
useful for policymakers and the public to see as feasible models to build on. What do you think about that, Professor? Do you think any of these ideas could make it into uh, the conversations you're having? So if you take the first model you talked about, where it's seen as negative income tax, um, you can view that as the natural extension of progressive income tax, where by having negative in income tax, if you have a very low income, you're just making the tax system more progressive. We should be going in the direction of making the tax system more progressive, tax the rich more and the poor less. And so the first model of negative income tax for people with very low income seems like a very good model to me. I just want to play devil's advocate for a second. If we were to steel man the other side on the topic of job automation, we've often heard this response that, yes, there will be jobs lost. We've seen this before. It's always the case, but there's going to be more jobs created, maybe better jobs, jobs that allow us to focus on higher order tasks. I really love to dig into this because I think it's the crux of the debate. Yes, I agree. What is your response? And my thought is that a super intelligent AI is unlike anything we've ever seen. It's very, very different from just a new machine that does something more efficiently. I mean, people used to make clothes by hand and then they make clothes with machines and there was massive unemployment. Um, but then eventually they got jobs doing other things. Um, but super intelligent things are going to take away nearly all the jobs. And the idea that there's going to be jobs that are still OK when you have super intelligent AI is quite dubious. I think the job of an interviewer, for example, will disappear too. Super intelligent AI will be able to do a better job of interviewing me. Um, so I sort of completely disagree with Jan on that. Right. And so... Unlike previous industrial revolutions, where we created things like the, we saw the loom, we saw automobiles, it still allowed us to do other new things that weren't automated yet. But could you say that this time with general and then eventually super intelligence, we could be ending, nearing the end of the path of discovering what can and can't be replaced in terms of human work? Yes. I think anything intellectual can be replaced. And eventually, um, we'll get dexterous machines too. That manual dexterity is lagging behind. But the robots are getting more dexterous all the time, and eventually it'll be physical things as well. I think intellectual things will be replaced first and then physical things later. So my advice has been, if you want to train for anything, train to be a plumber. That's probably good for another 10 years. <laughs> That's a really interesting example. Of course, we all need a plumber, but right. we can't all be a plumber. Right. And could we extend this to other types of jobs that share those attributes? Right? Yes, that need anything that hands. requires um, manual dexterity in awkward circumstances. Like if it's all routine, <laughs> if it's a sort of modern house that was built from a, a computer plan, um, you can probably maintain it with robots easily. But if it's an old Victorian house where none of the angles are quite right angles and things are falling apart and you have to dream up a way of making it work anyway, I think it'll be longer before AI can do that. Right. But not forever because we're not already forever, beginning no. to see praise developments in humanoid robots these days, yes. which can do figure one, show the robot doing laundry, which is menial yep. housework you might not even pay somebody to do. Right. It's still not doing it as well as people, but it's getting there. It reminds me of this recent paper from UC Berkeley. I love your take on this, Professor, where they polled almost 3,000 top-tier AI researchers, and they predicted about a 50% chance that all human occupations would be automatable sometime around 2100. Now, that seems like a very far time away, but like you said, it's very hard to predict even the next 15 years. So well, I would actually, I would actually suspect there's a good chance all human occupations can be automated before that. I'd have said sort of 50 years was a better bet, and maybe sooner. Wow. So that seems pretty urgent. Mathematicians, for example, mathematicians, I think they're going to be out of business fairly quickly, because mathematics is a closed system. It doesn't require data. So you can have an AI. It's it's like chess and go. You can have an AI that just has one module that um, proposes theorems and another module that tries to prove them. 
and it can just keep learning lots and lots of stuff about mathematics. And I think, and many mathematicians now are beginning to think, it may outstrip human mathematicians quite quickly.